too bad you have to go. Just as things were getting interesting. Yes. Tell me, Miss Trench, do you play any other games? This is the first day of a new month. It is the start of a new era, though. Has the world become a university, an indivisible knowledge system? Oh, welcome to the third edition of United Universities of Europe, um, a panel talk on higher education policy and European university cooperation. Um, I'm here in Berlin. My name is Tino Brömme, and I'm I'm joined by Peter van der Heiden in streaming and in spirit from Brussels. Hello, Peter. Hello, Tino. Uh, Peter is a higher education advisor um, after working 20 years in the European Commission. We have been talking often lately and um, today we want to inquire into two directions. One is the past, the Middle Ages, let's say Brexit and the Corona pandemic and also into the future, utopia, science fiction. We want to know how are United Universities and we want to know where they're going. So um, let's start with an easy question. Peter, in your contact with the European University alliances, uh, what's going on at the moment? Oh, well, uh, the, the European Universities, the 41, they have a lot on their plates, but, but they remain enthusiastic. Uh, they have to do with an evaluation because uh, it's a pilot phase after all they have to face that they have to apply for other funding like the eit now has a call uh, about innovation and more most important they have to become relevant for the the grassroots learners and staff in their institutions to get them on board and th this is uh, this is quite something but they are enthusiastic they're working hard they take many uh, initiatives in the longer term uh, it will be interesting to see whether all of this is transformational or marginal. But for the moment, uh, there is a kind of a reality shock. It's the hard work they are doing. I admire them a lot. And there is still a lot of momentum they can build on. So if the resources, eh, human resources, financial, can be mobilized, both internally and fresh money from outside, I think this can turn into a success. Uh, thank you. Um, also, a, a topic that seems to be very important now is governance, right? Um, the EUA, the European University Association, has just published a paper suggesting that there is a variety of governance models. Um, has this argument come up in your work recently? Yeah, I think they're all wrestling with that. Uh, they have to manage the project, they have to manage the alliance, and they have an assignment under the call that they uh, had signed up to is to reflect on the future, how to organize these kind of new animals, these alliances, what, what, what does it mean? And I would say that you need governments that match your ambitions, the, the activities that you do now, those that you want to do in the future. And my guess is uh, that it will vary with the nature and intensity of cooperation. It may very well be that the nature and intensity of cooperation is different in education, uh, in research, or an outreach. So you have to find solutions or general ones and specific ones to cover these kinds of government's needs. Always putting your mission and your activity first. Yes, in fact, um, the types of university alliances are very different and so their plans and their way of coordinating each other might be different in the future too. Although I'm very curious how they are going to be models. One of their missions is to um, um, formulate models for other universities. But let's mm -hmm. now, mm -hmm. what do you think? Oh, definitely they can be models because they, they are kind of a, a test that. So they're doing things that all universities are doing on their own or on smaller projects. And now they're doing it in a very structured way. They all look at uh, curricula together. They all look at questions of admission. They all look uh, at uh, their incubators and their, their challenge-based approach. They all have to develop a common research agenda. That, that is quite something. And we have to see how they deal with that. And I think uh, 
other universities out there can learn from such experiences. Yes, Peter. Um, but let's now talk a little bit about Brexit and its impact on the universities. Well, Brexit, the government of the UK and the European uh, Union have found an agreement that came into effect um, in January now, finally. Um, the result is that the UK will stay in the Horizon Europe program, in the science funding program, but the UK has left Erasmus+. Plus, so the mobility aspect doesn't seem to be so important to um, the British government. Johnson said it would have been extremely expensive to keep it while the UK has made a calculation according to which um, the UK has earned 250 million with um, European students coming to the UK every year. However, um, the agreement has also determined immigration rules, health insurance, data protection, education business, nuclear science, space research and clinical trials. So a lot of things uh, of which university are concerned. Well, um, we have, what is your take on uh, Brexit from Brussels, Peter? Uh, well, the Brexit bottom line, I would say, is love thy neighbor. Yes, we are in an awkward situation with Brexit, but in terms of scientific excellence and in terms of geopolitics, we should cooperate with the UK as we do with Switzerland, Israel, and by all means, the United States. There are common interests, values, there's a set of rules that is worth defending. Think of topics like academic freedom, intellectual property, and security issues. So we are condemned to work together and to make our cooperation a success and solve whatever we are now negotiating about. It seems a positive condemnation to me. Um, we said that um, UK also stays in the Horizon Europe program. And this includes the European Institute of Innovation and Technology, uh, which, as you said, um, have actually a pilot call for proposals called Innovation Capacity Building for Higher Education Running. Um, it has a key message. It says it is expected that 23 higher education institution led pilot projects will be selected from this pilot call. Um, I'm a little bit um, irritated. 23 and um, there are 41 European University Alliances. Yeah, the, 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 that's probably a matter of uh, resources, but taking from the positive end, uh, the MANA going to European University Alliance is, is not stopping. Uh, we have money to get better organized in terms of education from uh, Erasmus, money to get better organized in terms of research, research agendas from uh, Horizon Research Era uh, agenda. And now we have money to improve the way you innovate where you work in your ecosystem from the EIT. It's true, it's, uh, it's 23 instead of 41. It's not exclusively for the European University Alliances. It's also for other clubs. Uh, in every winning consortia, there will be also existing EIT uh, kick member universities. Maybe they are also in the European universities. You could have overlap there. But I think 23, uh, it is a pilot, like uh, the first and second round of the European universities was a pilot. And that is then quite substantial uh, to test uh, this innovation organization capacity with 23 alliances, of which maybe, I don't know, two thirds will be also European universities. Hmm. It's good news overall. And there are other pots waiting out there for our innovative universities, be they in alliances or not. Right. Um, at any rate, we have Anne Corbett in our midst, a researcher and author since many years, born in London, now living in Paris and a senior associate of the LSE Consulting, London School of Economics. Um, Anne, thank you for joining us. You told me that you are preparing a book is it allowed to ask already what it will be about? Well, of course it is. Um, I mean, it's a, a book which has been inspired by Brexit uh, as the sort of conjunctural factor. But actually, I've been sort of working on European higher education for a long time. 
And um, so uh, the book is about um, what does the Brexit shock represent for universities in Britain and Europe? And then I look at it in some sort of historical uh, um, depths as well to see, in fact, which is after all, um, uh, I think of it, uh, I would like to claim that it's a good academic way of looking at it because out of every shock comes opportunities as, as well as as, as well as restraints. I'm wondering, industry and intellectual movement across the borders is now more the rule than the exception. And part of this productive uh, forces are the universities. Do you think that the people who made Brexit happen are not aware of this new times? Well, I, I, I think they've got a different, I think there's a different view. You know, the, 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 this has been driven by a, a government which is ideologically extraordinarily united, which perhaps represents, I've seen it, just seen a poll on this, 13% um, of the population who still believe very strongly in Brexit. You know, we've now got people accepting Brexit as being done and, and therefore thinking more in conventional party terms. But this government has, is absolutely driven by the idea that um, Britain's role is global. Um, so I, I think that's their mentality. I don't, th I don't know how many of them are, I don't suppose any of them are bilingual, but I don't know how many of them, I, I may be mis misjudging them, but they don't have a European culture. And that you've seen reflected in British policy for years. I mean, and even back to the time of Tony Blair, who was a European, um, but he never really exploited the opportunity to educate the, the British public about Europe. And after that, it was, you know, uh, a cynicism has grown. I think a lot of misrepresentation. As somebody interested in education, I think it's a tragedy that British leaders ever since joining the EU have never really taken the time to uh, educate. I mean, even in schools, I don't think it's a subject. They've never taken the time to explain to people at large the benefits of Europe. And then when you get economic stress and it's allied with immigration, particularly from other parts, from poorer parts of Europe, and then there's a reaction against that. Um, and now you see what, what's happening. It's not peculiar to Britain, but that's the form it's taken in Britain. But um, is it all bad? Being in the EU um, got this evergreen pinky shine on it. Aren't there national structures rolled over by the European harmonization that are worth saving, in your opinion? Well, um, personally, no. I think that, um, again, what the Brexit vote showed was that people were absolutely fed up with, the, with um, they kicked the government. The, Brexit was extraordinary because it allowed one person, one vote, instead of a system that we actually have where a lot of votes don't count because the, uh, it's this majority, majoritarian system. Um, but the pe things that people complained about was the economy, deindustrialization, not having um, uh, jobs that, that take the place of the old industries, uh, the increasing gap between rich and poor. None of that is, is, comes from Europe. That is the outcome of political choices within the national government. Mm -hmm. so, uh, but what I think is um, um, particular to Britain, um, we seem to be getting far from universities, but, you know, we have to look at the structures. You know, Britain's parliamentary sovereignty, Britain's constitution being unwritten, it's all quite slippery. It gives governments, um, we're seeing it with the present government, um, the right to do things, um, which in a more... Uh, in a country with a legal written constitution would be more difficult to do. And so I, I think this is all part of um, a general fog about what Europe's about and what the national government is about.
Does that answer the question? Yes. Thank you again, Anne. Well, since January, we have the um, <laughs> TCA, the EU-UK Trade and Cooperation Agreement, uh, where also science and higher education have their share. How do you judge the results um, of this um, agreement for uh, universities? Well, um, can I take that in two parts? Um, and the first is what the legal agreement with the EU is. And it's not just the TCA, which is the Trade and Cooperation Agreement. It's also the Withdrawal Act. And the, the Withdrawal Act was actually taking Britain out of um, uh, the core EU legislation, the Four Freedoms. And so for universities, for higher education, for really a very large bit of the British population, uh, the core thing was losing freedom of movement. This has been the freedom to work, to study uh, anywhere within the EU. And it was disguised a bit because we had a transition period and it only came into effect on January the 1st this year. But I would say the core thing is that losing that freedom of movement and therefore the choice of things um, and it affects professional um, recognition as well. Then the secondly is the TCA, which was the political agreement, which is largely focused on trade. But as you rightly say, it affects science and um, education because it affects the programmes of the EU. Um, in law, Britain had every opportunity to join in these, these programmes because the EU opens them to non-EU members. In the case of Horizon, the science programme, they've accepted that uh, with enthusiasm. Uh, Britain, of course, <clears throat> has had a, a, a very successful record in Horizon, um, sorry, <clears throat> able to lead a lot of projects. But, they also chose, as you know, not to participate in Erasmus. And Erasmus um, is tragic. It's much valued by universities in Britain and by further education colleges because it's, it, and, and also by um, academics and staff who can use it for, who have benefited from things like the Jean Monnet programme. But um, the British, the, the British government's always had a very narrow view of Erasmus and what it, it, the way it, it judges Erasmus is that uh, a lot more students come into Britain than go out through Erasmus. And so it sees it as, as losing money. It's never understood the breadth of Erasmus. It's never understood about reciprocity, um, but that's the judgment it's made and it's, it's produced its alternative. Um, which we can talk about, but is nothing like Erasmus. Mm. So I personally think it's a tragedy, but um, it's happened and, and it, won't, that, it won't be changed in anything like the near future. Um, I heard British university leaders who take it quite from the bright side, like Peter Matheson, principal of the University of Edinburgh. He said, well, let's look forward to the next negotiations after 2027. He was quite positive, uh, I had the impression. What is the opinion on, um, at British universities off record um, about Brexit? Is it, is it more positive? But um, no, uh, in the short term, universities were devastated by Brexit. Um, there were there were a few which um, made long-term plans from the beginning, like Imperial College, you know, the great science university, which now has a structural link with Munich so that it sort of can be considered European. Um, I think the University of Kent has structural links in, in a base in Brussels. Uh, some have tried rather imaginative things, University College London, has linked, has asked, it was a very good move, I think. It asked its academics how it thought the university could thrive after leaving the EU. And the academics came up with the idea that um, 
or, or the universe between them, um, uh, that there could be very strong links between towns rather than between countries. And so um, <clears throat> they've developed very, very distinct and strong um, disciplinary links with particular universities in Rome, in Paris, and in other, other cities. But um, um, others are struggling. They're struggling with whether they will get enough students, um, oh. international students. They're struggling with whether they will get enough EU students. They don't want to lose EU students who will be put off by the fees, hmm. you know, because that, that changes the culture of a classroom. All right, next question. I read an interesting interview in Newsweek um, with Sir Ed Byrne, the former president of King's College. He said he was very proud of robust partnerships abroad, especially also in Europe. And he talks about the research intensive universities working together in Europe. He said, we have broad ranging partnerships with the University of Paris and the University of Dresden. We formed a thing called trans campus deaneries That's a faculty where the researchers and academics are jointly appointed and paid for by both universities. Um, do you feel um, the rise of European university alliances is signaling that the university is in a moment of change? Well, um, I think you put your finger on something rather important there, because I think that what Byrne is describing There have been all sorts of signs of universities, um, perhaps particularly, particularly elite universities and particularly the um, creative, the music and the arts colleges, um, theatre uh, education, who absolutely depended on, on cross-border contacts. Um, I think, I th and for example, law has been an area where universities have had partnerships uh, across borders. Um, I think that indeed we're in a situation where universities will be thinking more and more about that. Partly it's driven indeed by the needs of researchers who, who function across borders. Um, and so I think that we will see more of that. Uh, in terms of what the uh, universe, European Universities Initiative will achieve, um, Uh, again, I, I, I think, you know, this is let a thousand flowers bloom. Um, I think that that's a, that's a, a great, a great thing too. And um, uh, I personally felt quite elated watching some of your videos and, and seeing the reactions of seeing people who are on the job describing what they're doing. Yeah, I, I, I think that this is releasing an energy which... Um, You know, it's a product of our times, and in the British case, maybe maybe spurred by Brexit. Thank you, Anne. Um, let's talk again when your book is out. I can't wait to read it. Yes, come back, come back to me on it. But... Yes, we have another guest today. Um, it's uh, Professor Nenad Zirnic from the University of Belgrade. He is the vice rector of international relations. He is full professor of uh, material handling and logistics. And he is a member of a um, working group um, that is preparing the new higher education law in Serbia. His university, the University of Belgrade, is also a member of the Circle U Alliance. Um, but um, Nenad, Serbia is not even a member of the EU. How is that possible? Uh, I can see that the, uh, the, our alliance is not the real picture of the European Union. Maybe it is the, the better explanation, because out of seven members, we have Serbia, which is a candidate to, to join the European Union. We have Norway. Uh, Norway is not the member of European Union. And interesting, we have the King's College from London, and the uh, UK is the former member of European Union. Of course, we have the, the, the participants, uh, our partners from France and Germany, Uh, actually, the, the both countries are the, the power forces of European Union at the moment. But also we have uh, our partner is uh, uh, from the Belgium, Université uh, Catholique de Louvain, I mean, the, the French-speaking university located okay, in Louvain. -Louvain. At what stage is your cooperation with the other universities at the moment? 
Well, uh, uh, as I already said, uh, our priorities at the moment are activities in the circular lines. Also, uh, we uh, we uh, today was the, the the Senate meetings, the Senate of the University, and uh, we also the, the members of the Senate that uh, they adopted the new strategy of mobility, and uh, of course we are going to continue. Uh, uh, the students and the staff mobilities with our partners in Europe and uh, uh, outside Europe. But our priority will be the universities, which are the members of the Circular Alliance. Mm -hmm. This is the the, uh, uh, the idea how we uh, we can formulate our long term vision of the mobility strategy. And also, we of course the the the. the the time is uh, a little bit difficult because we are affected also by COVID. So we we just adopted the the uh, those uh, online so called online mobilities. But I think this is not the idea of the European Union to make Erasmus to to have online uh, uh, mobilities. Uh, we have the discussions every day. But I think that the idea that students from Serbia can go, for example, to Germany or I don't know to Sweden. And to, to 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 meet some different people. I mean, not completely different, but to to see the, their habits, the, the system of education. I mean, the life in those countries. Uh, maybe to 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 learn the the the, the lo local language, not only English. I mean, the, the, the English is uh, lingua franca. I mean, for for Eras Erasmus program. And I mean, uh, if we will have the the or the online mobilities. I think that is the, the worst thing that can happen to the students because, uh, you know, or, or not only uh, passing exams, but you have the, the, the social contacts and I, I consider them very important because a lot of connections that they have now in my professional life, I made during my, my uh, students' day or even before in the, in the school or something like that. Hmm. Yes, I think so too. Uh, let, me, let me come back to Brexit for a moment. Uh, what is your opinion about its effect on universities? Well, uh, it, it is difficult to, 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 to say. I mean, uh, we, we have to wait uh, the, the period that I think at least five or maybe ten years to, to be what will be the real consequences of the Brexit, Brexit to both sides, to, to Great Britain and uh, to European Union as well. Uh, uh, as I already mentioned, I think that, uh, for example, for the, the, the smaller country, as for example, Serbia is, we have only 7 million of people living. Uh, in, in my country, the European Union is the perfect solution I mean, uh, for the future. But maybe Great Britain is a bigger country, so maybe uh, they have a, their tradition or something like that. And, uh, also, they have the excellent universities. If we speak about universities, for example, Oxford and Cambridge, the Imperial College, and many others, they don't need to, to be in European uh, alliances. They feel that they, they are not they are enough strong as the, practically the institutions of higher education. I mean, uh, in, in Harvard, uh, to, to 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 be stable and to to sustain, you know, long. Um. Have your universities' relations uh, to uh, English universities changed since Brexit? Uh, I think that uh, we have the, the same level of, of, of cooperation with the, 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 let's say, British universities. Uh, in the meantime, we, we, we established one new uh, uh, MOU that was with the St. Andrews University, but this is from Scotland, uh, not from England. But actually, I, I just uh, uh, compared the, the numbers before and after Brexit, and we have more or less the similar situation. If you speak about the mobilities, if you speak about the participation in uh, Horizon and something like that, uh, our cooperation, honestly speaking, before Brexit uh, was relatively modest, and uh, it is still modest after Brexit. Mm -hmm. Uh, good, uh, good uh, connection is that uh, the, the the most uh, important Serbian trade partners are, for example, Italy and Germany. Hmm. And um, last question before I finish: Are you not concerned that Brexit may impair your relations with the Euro um, United Kingdom? 
uh, I have to say that our partner is the King's College from London, and you're right. Uh, when we speak privately with our co colleagues, they're very they're very unhappy to to leave European Union. I mean, and, and, uh, they think that this is the, the the very bad things for the future of of their universities, and they're very glad to have this opportunity to join the alliance. It was uh, some kind of this transition period before the, 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 the UK left the, the, the uh, Erasmus Plus as a program country. So they are very happy to, to be the member of our alliances, but uh, the problem will be what will happen when the project uh, will be completed. Uh, we don't uh, make the alliance to be sustainable only until the end of the project, but we also have the vision of the long-term cooperation. And uh, uh, for that reason, so we made the international association of uh, our universities, uh, of our Circle U Alliance in Brussels. And we hope that will be the way how to, to prolong the, co the, the cooperation in the next years or in the next decades. I mean, all of that, that universities are our strategic partners from the future. And I think College will be the strategic partner of the University of Belgrade, I mean, in, in, in the, 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 the coming years. Good. It's good to know that your university of Belgrade uh, and that universities are European in such a cultural sense of the word. Well, Nina, thanks for your contribution. Um, we're going back to uh, Peter now. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, European Commission is preparing the next budgetary period uh, until 2027. And um, uh, regarding the unit, uh, European University Alliances is having a lot of stakeholder consultations um, involving the member states and the coordinators of the University Alliances. Their aim is to define the future um, direction in strong alignment with Horizon Europe and other instruments and national funding. Um, the process runs parallel with the European Commission's plan of the higher education transformation agenda and um, concrete plans will be outlined um, in the annual work program 2022. A new call is also being prepared now that will come out uh, by the end of this year and it will target the existing alliances and new alliances. Well, let's, let's have a um, um, talk about the last issue, which is the European Council conclusions. They are expected mid-May and um, they are also dealing with uh, European universities or with universities and science in general. Um, Peter, um, how will these European Council conclusions be relevant for the European universities? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a political text, it's under negotiation. It will be important reference document. And what I would expect to see in such a document, uh, three things. I would expect the Council with the Commission to attack the existing national, legal and other barriers. Barriers that still exist against cooperation, against mobility. For instance, again, if you want to have micro-credentials, you need to adapt competition rules. You need to adapt the way you fund your institutions. The changes that we want to succeed through the European universities require adaptations of legislation in Brussels, but mainly in the capital cities of Europe. Number two, I would expect the Council to uh, express its willingness to use national and European funding, the recovery funds, the structural funds, to invest in the knowledge ecosystems locally and cross-border. Now, in particular, that money is cheap. We can build campuses, student housing, research facilities, labs, broadband. We can also work on societal outreach. Again, by widening the learning offer to more groups of learners through these micro-credentials, through university city pilots that a number of our universities are now experimenting with. Very promising and it needs to be supported and funded. Number three, I would say, let's recognize the global role that our universities can play in partnership with universities and other continents. It was overlooked in the pilot phase for good reasons, but now I think we should open up and see what role these alliances can play globally. I talk about existing alliances, they can put forward their ideas, and so can 
new alliances in different fields, different types of institutions. I know there are a few in the waiting room. IVs are boiling. Let's learn from the pile of experience and widen the scope. That would be my expectation for a political document that we will see in the month of May. Well, thank you for this um, opinion and interpretation of the upcoming European Council conclusions, Peter. Thank you so far for your participation. Um, we want to talk about the future of university alliances. 2022 sounds to me like science fiction. I found a research paper recently um, on science fiction literature that discusses the cooperation between research, science, universities with society. And um, we talked with Pedro Marquez in Valencia about it, who is a co-author of it. Let's listen to it. Is that the whole point of the doomsday machine is lost? If you keep it a secret, why didn't you tell the world, eh? United Universities of Europe, is it science fiction? Is one university for the whole of Europe or even for the whole world, is it a realistic utopia? Or is it the other way around? Is the world become um, a university, an undivisible knowledge system? And something that Borges would describe, something that we haven't just noticed yet? Let's look into science fiction literature to find out what is the relation between society and universities? What is the impact of research on society? Pedro Marquez has just published a paper about just that, and we're going to talk to him. The idea actually came from my co-author, Joaquin Azagro. Well, if you look at the literature now, there's the academic literature, yeah, the papers, the books on university, third mission, university interaction with society. Almost all of it looks at it from a positive perspective. Right? But there actually used to be some more critical literature in the past, but it's kind of disappeared. And he said, well, let's try and find a way to, to see how society looks at this thing. Then our uh, methodology in selecting the books was all the books that have been awarded the three major science fiction uh, uh, awards, plus Dune, which is a foundational uh, book in the modern uh, science fiction. And, and so because, the, of course, the, these awards have been given through time, there was also a chronological aspect of it. So. As, as this public perception changed over time. So there were these two questions. So is it negative or positive? And has it changed over the last few decades? You have done this research on science fiction literature um, together with Laura Gonzalez Salmeron and uh, Joaquin Asagra Caro. You're all from Valencia. Um, please tell me, what was the most striking discovery you made? There is, let's the, 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 say, the, the normal narrative element of the disinterested researcher versus the you know money seeking or profit seeking or power seeking researcher what we noticed though is that as time went by this tension disappeared in the in the in the in the, in the books and so you see almost like a i don't know a seamless sort of like a a, a non problematic interaction between science or universities and government and business and we our our main conclusion was well either people let's say culture society accepted uh, that indeed this interaction is positive or the other way around is nobody expects the scientists anymore to be the disinterested public servant and everyone just assumes that science is in it for money and power so we operate in a context where okay the universities want to do good things but the pressure from the funding agencies, from the governments, is to get resources, get research money, publish. And this takes a lot of time if you want to do it well. And this takes time away from doing other things, engagement, you know, uh, working with social partners, uh, trying to do things that don't necessarily have an academic output, but actually give something to society. So I think there's always this tension. You are not cured yet, boy. But sirs, missus, I see that it's wrong. It's wrong because it's like against society. Pedro, your university, the UPV, 
is part of a university alliance called Enhance. The interesting thing is that their self-perception is very positive. We work for the people, for society. In their mission statement, three times people appear. What I want to know, looking into science fiction literature, how is the perception of the university from outside? Even when you talk to businesses who you think would have a more, let's say, natural attitude towards it, they often don't see the university as an accessible place. <clears throat> Sorry, they don't see the university as a place that they can go and talk to people and exchange ideas. It's, it's actually seen as very closed, a very difficult space to enter. And, you know, all the university professors are very arrogant. And they think they're better than everyone else. So I actually, I don't think this... Uh, this image of the, the good university opens up. And I, I, my specialization is in regional development. And ever since I joined academia, I've always had this interest of talking to policymakers and engaging with them. So I try to find time for that, but it's not easy. It's not easy because I always have to think, okay, every time I spend a week, two weeks, a month working with a policymaker, it's one paper I'm not writing. And that could be bad for my career. So th there is that tension, uh, I think, both the perception and the reality of it is far from perfect. This, all of this is academic. You were made as well as we could make you, but not to last. I think in a lot of these books, people are very cynical towards it. This, they just accept that knowledge is at the service of business, profit, or even war. I think one of the most interesting books I read was uh, called Forever War, uh, which is this, it's a very interesting book, but it's about a, a war that starts between humans and an alien race and lasts for centuries. And they're at war with each other. Um, and then at some point, the humans evolve to a point where they have telepathic powers. And it turns out that the aliens also had telepathic powers. So they start communicating. They, they say, why are we at war? And the aliens said, no, we thought you started it. And the humans said, no, no, we were told you started it. And, and so they realized that actually it had just been the military and the government institutions in, in uh, Earth that had an interest in propagating this lie. And, they, and, and everything was at the service of it. The economy, the universities, science was all at the service of it. Uh, dear Pedro, in your research about science fiction, um, do you find out if society is satisfied um, about the direction in which research is going? The institution itself doesn't really, as much as they want to or they say, the institution is actually prepared to deal more with like powerful interests, but then at the level of the researcher, you if you have the freedom to do it, there are people who, who commit to that idea of uh, science for society. Yes, thank you, Pedro. In fact, that is it. The institution is a big mammoth who works with the powers and the single, the individual scientist can be the one who makes the change. Let's look how the European University Alliances develop in this regard. Thank you for listening and have a nice afternoon. Goodbye. I would like to go directly uh, to another vision of the future. We interviewed um, students of UNA Europa after the student congress in late February and asked them about their vision of the ideal future university. I want to play it for you. I would love to see universities cooperating between one another. I imagine something more uh, innovative that, uh, you know, Europa could bring. My dream is to um, study and travel. This idea of university coming from the past and not changing, it's just a block and they still do the same things. No, this is not the idea they have. Different ways of creating and sharing knowledge are better than only one way. The future university for me is like international knowledge, like inter-European university, but like a huge one, as you know. Uh, like I would see like universities from Mexico, from Australia, from China together. More integrated and holistic view of university. The University of the Future would be the European universities of national level, bringing together their competences and their skills to create a better uh, environment uh, of uh, learning that can be a matter of attraction for both uh, European students uh, as well as the foreign students. Like having a, a course as a podcast that I, you can just listen to on the way. More on time with what we are experiencing in the world right now. If I want to study one semester here, 
that's okay if I want to study one semester in France, I do it there. I believe it's it's essential. I mean, what we see in the world is the U.S., China, these giants, and we have to do something together if you want to compete. With the uh, European Council conclusions, the definition of the European University Alliance will become sharper. The topic of the next UUU panel will be degree design, competence frameworks and horizontal mindsets, where we talk about the difficulties to make new degrees, to work with them together to make joint degrees. And um, also, we will invite professionals from all university alliances to talk about their professions again. We will talk with uh, human resources, with the directors of education, or with librarians and uh, the way their profession is changing. These professional sessions will be not live, but they will be organized to uh, learn more about what these professions uh, require in the future. I want to say thank you to all participants of the panel, to Anne, Peter, Nenad and Pedro and to the Una Europa students. Um, and thanks also to you who watched. Please write your comments in the comment section and your wishes who you want to have interviewed in this um, topic. Um, I hope to see you all again in the next UU panel and thank you and good afternoon. Goodbye.